Hello? Huh? Yes, is this Ni Nicholas Veronico? Speaking. This this is Nicholas Veronico. Yes, who's this? How you doing, uh, Mr. Veronico? My name is Robert Bassano. I'm a graduate student. Um, I'm uh, studying artificial intelligence at Stanford. Um, I was wondering if you personally could be able to provide me with a little bit more detail on the Sophia platform or if you could recommend someone I could speak to. Um, I'm working on an application that would allow for a machine learning program to pick up and identify specific objects using um, high performance optical telescopes. You, the, my instant thought is that there's a problem there because we see in the infrared. You see in the infrared? Yeah, so Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Okay. So it's not, we don't, we don't see things like an optical telescope. We have to find like stars near our infrared source and we focus the telescope on a black spot in space Okay. And then we get the infrared radiation through our instruments. So, uh, so Sophia only so Sophia views everything in the sky on an infrared scale on wavelength, right? That's that's where we do our research. We do our optical guiding through what you and I see. Okay. So let's just say, you know, whatever I'm seeing up in the sky, if I can see it with ground-based telescope, you would be able to see that that same object in infrared. Yes. Okay. So now how... You see things you can't see it with an optical telescope. Okay. Now how does that compare to HST? Is, 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 Sophia, linked, is Sophia linked with HST? No. They're, they see out to about five microns in the infrared. Okay. And we go uh, out to 250 to 300 microns right now. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you serious? So wait, wait, you're saying Sophia, which flies at around 35, 45,000 feet, can see nearly 150 times further than Hubble in the infrared? Yes, yes. Wow, Nick. Wow. Probably. How is that? Yeah. Huh? Awesome. How is that possible? Because we we're two different we're two different we're apples and oranges. That's how apples and oranges. So so I, you know, I like oranges. You know, it's good in vitamin C. So <laughs> which one? <laughs> how big would be your orange, and how big would be the apple? <laughs> so uh, actually, our both of our telescope mirrors are about the same size. That's yeah, yeah, I noticed that. It, yeah. One hundred. I, and I absolutely didn't. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, that's. It's just. It's the 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 instruments they use are different than what we use, and that's really the only difference. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to determine because I looked at. I conducted a comparison of the technical specs of of HST, and the technical specs of Sophia. So, and I know that the Sophia program. Well, not the Sophia program per se, but the Stratosphere Observatory platform is older than HST. Um, you guys have just been doing it on different aerial platforms and it just grew to a 747. That's what I've been doing the history on. But I, I noticed that the, that the technical specs are almost similar. But I'm trying to wrap my head around how is it possible you have HST, which supposed to be 330 miles plus, you know, beyond the exosphere. And you've got Sophia, which is in the stratosphere. You guys are looking far beyond. You're looking through another few couple of layers and looking way past HST and you're able to capture things on a much more, how, would it be fair to say a high definition type of quality in infrared? Um, I don't know about that, but the thing, so NASA has HST, they have SOFIA in infrared, Okay. they have what, Chandra and X-ray, they have all different uh, observatories to cover all of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. And 
if we all look at the same thing, the same object, you're going to learn something different depending on, you know, what uh, wavelength you're looking at it. Okay. So that's why they, that's why we have all these different telescopes. Is, uh, you know, we can do things that others can't do, and you know, they can see things that we can't see. So uh, it's a good marriage. Now, now, is has, has there been occasions where, where Sophia and HST, HST are taking the same exact photo of the same exact object on the same day? No. 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 But, no. What happens is we put out a call for proposals. As a matter of fact, there's one open right now. Okay. And we take all those proposals, and they decide what is the best use of Sophia. Okay. And then they award time to those proposals, and we go out and let's say you got eight hours of observing time from you know some star forming region. Okay. You you might get three hours on one flight, an hour and a half on another, two hours on one, and you know. How how, how many flight. platforms are there for Sophia? Is there just one plat one aircraft? One aircraft, but we have uh, seven eight different instruments. Okay. And but we only fly one instrument at a time. It takes about two days to change it. Now, it, there's a. Uh, is Sophia still based in New Zealand, or is it, or is it in the U.S.? It's it's out of Palmdale is where the airplane resides, but the scientists are all in Mountain View. Okay. And we're having a uh, a science seminar, a conference in. Uh, down by Santa Cruz at the Asilomar Conference Center in October. Okay. And that's something you might want to go to. Asilomar. And I, yeah. And let me see if I can uh, let me get my computer started and I'll. Uh, yeah, because, and, and, and you know, something else that's interesting because I, here's the thing I had been looking at some of the images from Sophia and, and HST, and I know this may sound weird, Nick. But I found a photo, a comparative photo from a ground observatory, Sophia and HST of the M82 supernova. The photo was taken around January 22nd of 2014. Now, hold your, your oranges and apples for this one. They were taken on the same day. That, yes. As a matter of fact, I think I was on Sophia for that picture. You're kidding. You were on Sophia when that picture was taken? Yep. So you, you were on, on board when, when the infrared was taken of the M82 supernova on January 22nd, 2014? Yeah. Oh, man. Did I get lucky with you? Did I get lucky with you? Man, thank you so much for verifying that. Is there any way you could actually email me? The I mean, because you know I get the information online at you guys' site, but a lot of the information is just scattered all over the place because I'm not even sure if the photos for Sophia online on NASA are up to date. Because I'm getting very limited from HST team. I spoke to people at HST, and he, you want to hear something interesting? Have you ever seen Have you ever seen HST in in, in real time in operation? You've never seen it. How how long we how, how long have you been with the Sophia team? Eight years. Eight years. Well, here's the thing. You know, Director Bolden was the the mission commander for HST when it launched. Well, right. you know, and they had the servicing missions. So I had a I had a talk with one of the deputy program managers, and you know, he had been working for working on the HST team for 25 years. And, you know, I was, I was, are you familiar with the FAI database? Federation Aeronautic International? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know that vast majority of all of the uh, STS missions are on that database, including Apollo and all the Russian launches and other countries, um, including Phyllis Baumgartner's records on there. So I went searching for, because I needed to know um, at what altitude 
did the um, STS-31 got to, to basically deploy HST. And I saw a recent video on JPL, it's on their website, where they show the 2002 servicing mission. And it dawned on me that STS in 2002 was on top of HST. Now, <laughs> I thought that that was actually a weird photo because it shows it shows the Earth in, on the bottom, of course, and then it shows it shows the STS shuttle on top of HST servicing it, getting ready to deploy it. And then when I asked the question of HST team members, I said, "Wait a minute! When I put in, you know, the flight date for HST in 1990, it's not there." And the response, you know, was what I expected. You know, NASA doesn't manage the FAI database. But when you start, when you put in the servicing missions, the servicing, most of the servicing missions are there, but two of the servicing missions are not listed. Well, here's the kicker. HST launch April 24th, 1990. If you put in that flight number, the year, all of the crew member name for that flight, it's not in the database. So I asked HST, is there a reason why someone didn't submit the application or the documentation to the FAI for this? He says, I don't know. We don't manage that database. I said, that's understandable. And I said, but how is it that some of the servicing missions that are there, but the main mission to put HST at 330 miles is not there? That was supposed to be the greatest mass lifted to the greatest altitude. You know, and I, I put in all the variables. I contacted AFI. They said that there was no problems with their database. They even looked back in their records. It took them about, you know, a month and a half. They, and they said, well, you know, we don't even have an application or any documentation that was filed for that mission. He goes, you might want to you might want to call back to NASA and ask them. So, you know, of course, I call NASA to ask them. And, you know, you figure in 25 years, somebody who's responsible for doing this, which they don't know who's responsible for doing it. They all said, hmm, that's interesting, just like you just did. Hmm, that's interesting. So I asked the deputy project manager, is it possible? Have you ever seen HST? He says, no, I've only seen it on the servicing missions. I said, okay, you've seen the servicing missions. I said, but nobody's ever set eyes on it. He goes, no, we don't have optical tracking. I said, okay. I said, are you familiar with Sophia? He says, yes, yeah, somewhat. So when I told him what the capabilities of Sophia was versus Hubble, he says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Sophia can't do infrared and wavelength like Hubble. I said, that's not true. I'm on Sophia's website right now. <laughs> and it says it in the OIG, in Office Inspector General Report, what Sophia is capable of doing in wavelengths. And I have I tried to share the document. He says, well, you know, they, they must have a new capability. I said, is that possible? Because the telescopes are almost identical. <laughs> almost identical. As a matter of fact, Sophia at 45,000 feet can see things much further than HST in infrared. How is that possible? And he didn't know. So that's why I had to call you. <laughs> because I wanted to be clear that you know, because sometimes, you know, when media information is put out and technical information, it, it might get mixed up with something else. And if I'm going to be drafting a research paper on this using artificial intelligence based on images you guys already taken so that, so that the, 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 the API for this machine learning program will be able to discern what you looked at before to look for any other sort of anomalies, I need that paper needs to be spot on because... I want to publish it and I can't publish something that's technically inaccurate and then I get laughed at you know what I mean yeah. so I just thought that that was strange that Hubble is not even showing in an international database at all so I'm, I'm I've come to the logical conclusion that Sophia has, has been our platform for all you know optical science research
think you need to look at some of this stuff a little more. What's, what stuff? Uh, just some of the links I'm going to send you. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, but it's just it's just strange because um, you know, I, I was trying to get more data on HST and there's nothing. It just stopped all of a sudden, and and, and it stopped well before 2002. It just stopped. What? what uh, where are you at at Stanford? Um, I'm I'm doing their graduate uh, certificate in AI. And then I'm going to move on to uh, machine learning and um, robotics. Nice. Okay, well, let me get this uh, email over to you. Yeah, I developed an algorithm about 10 years ago that was shared with JPL, and it caught their interest because um, it 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 allowed for it allowed for the reconfiguration of a test and, test and measurement device to pick up ultra low frequency, ultra high energy signal transmission. Hmm. And the first thing they said was, who are you and where did you get this from? Because <laughs> I guess it helped them locate something that they had trouble communicating with. And yeah, it, it, it's a multi-use algorithm that I developed. I, I didn't, at the time when I was working on it, it was for something else specific. And then I modified it, shared it with professors, at two professors in theoretical physics and applied mathematics at MIT. They said it was beyond them. And then two months later, I get an email back from one of them in a handwritten note. It says, Robert, this may be of interest to you and it involves black body radiation. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know what that was at the time. And I called them up and I said, Blackboard, what? why did you send me Max Planck's constant in an equation? He goes, you want to start researching this. I said, well, can you help me? He goes, no, because what you developed in an algorithm is beyond me, but I think this may be the missing piece. So I, I've been researching black body radiation. And lo and behold, when I started to you know, tootle around with my algorithm and some other mathematics using Planck's constant, it literally opened the door for me to start doing the research on artificial intelligence with regard to image image analysis processing and identification of um, specific type of bodies that are emitting a certain type of light. And if, if you're familiar with black body radiation, which I'm still getting familiar with it myself, I've been watching a bunch of videos on it, and it, let's just put it this way, it's really fascinating. I started putting together and infusing dark matter, dark fluid with super helium-4, and potentially um, now someone's introduced me to what sulfur hexafluoride can do. And when you combine the both, it, Something very interesting occurs, and I think I know why we can't see things on a specific spectrum using, say, the Sophia platform or Hubble. What I'm saying is this, is there's a possibility I might have created the capability for you to see something that you're looking for that may be right in your line of view, but no one knows how to put together the calculations of mathematics. And I'm not saying you guys don't. I'm just saying that there's a possibility. And I, of course I can't do it from the, from the ground. But it would require looking at the same object you might have been looking at and seeing a lot more of what may be comprising the vision of that object. 